Good morning. It's Thursday, July 28th, 2022. Welcome to Triggered. I'm Corey Morgan. This is the Western Standards Daily Live News Opinion. Remember that, people? Opinion and guest show. We cover events, talk about things, have inter... Oh, I said the wrong word there. We exchange ideas with each other, and uh, being live, it's great that way. Use that comment scroll, guys. That's what it's about. You know, I, this is what makes the difference between live and recorded stuff. We can uh, just kind of go with things as they go and take the conversations where they will. I really enjoy that when it gets going. So don't hesitate to send things out. I don't necessarily respond to every con t- comment that's out there. The guests can't necessarily respond to them all either. But I do see them all when they're up there, and uh, it's just good to see that engagement. Engage with each other as well. Again, just keep it civil. I know we take things uh, pretty seriously with politics. Just don't take them personally. And we can have a good time and get through the show and have a productive day. Starting, I see somebody came in early asking about, because I got Paul Hinman coming on, and I'll explain that. Uh, If anybody from the Osted board is going to be on today, that's SRT Bull who said that. And uh, no, I don't have anybody from that board yet. I did uh, reach out to G. Van Manget, who's listed as the interim leader of the party by some. And he said he's uh, not really in a position to comment. He's sick with uh, COVID right now. And to reach out to Rick Northey, who was the maybe president. I'm not sure where things are with the party, but Mr. Northey isn't really talking to anybody these days either. So either way, I will talk to, uh, I should get onto that with some guests, Paul Hinman and Angela Tabak, who were, according to one faction in the party, the leader and president of the Wild Rose Independence Party right now. So we'll talk to both of them and try and sort out a little bit of what's going on. Also going to have uh, Western Standard columnist Trevor Tucker on. He's written, basically puts a weekly column out for us. He's a professor out in Ontario. Good, thoughtful, uh, almost philosophical sort of things he puts out. I really like his stuff. We're going to talk about his last column and some other things. Ah, I see Debbie Motley coming from the Atlantic coast. I, I, I always like seeing, uh, you know, again, folks coming from across the country. Hey, I like seeing you guys checking in local as well, but just... Let's me know we're reaching a whole lot of people and having a good discussion on a lot of things. Let's talk about the observances while other folks are joining the show and getting signed in. We got it's National Chili Dog Day. You know, that, that's an underrated dish. You don't see them much anymore. They're kind of a an older fad or trend or whatever else. But I tell you, that combination, it's messy. It can be a little hard to eat, especially if you don't have a big bun or whatever. But I mean, chili on a, on a hot dog. Oh, I mean, talk about good drunk food to fire down outside of a bar or if you're out in a beach or something, somebody selling chili dogs. Oh, it's great stuff. So today's the day to indulge in a chili dog. And well, then tomorrow you pay the price for it or your coworkers will, but all the same, it's a good dish. It's also National Intern Day. This is a day I imagine to recognize and respect and, uh, you know, just to look at the contributions that interns give us, low paid labor. And uh, of course, we're offering experience in places that use interns, but that's uh they, they're there for abuse we call their office here the intern dungeon it's not as bad as all that but that is the corner we put them in and a word of warning to any business or uh, service that utilizes interns though if your intern's wearing a blue dress and has a box full of uh, cigars it's a trap be careful back off maybe find a new intern either way interns do make a mark on society or society made a mark on the dress the one time so well, let's see. We got folks coming from Peace River. Next up, all over, lots of folks in there. Let me get on to what I'm going on about today. Last night was the first uh, United Conservative Party debate. It was uh, a good one. It was held in Medicine Hat. Unfortunately, they had all sorts of technical issues. I'm just going to give my interpretation of what happened with it. So, starting the best line from the first UCP leaders debate actually came after the event was over. It was from Todd Lowen, and he said, the UCP asked for $1,050,000 in leadership fees, of which apparently very little was spent on a stable internet connection. I mean, the debate was live streamed, but it was constantly cutting out for extended periods. The terrible broadcast was the first newsmaking part of the event, and it didn't reflect very well on party management. Leadership contenders, I mean, they they were forced to pony up $175,000 each to take part in the race. The least they could have hoped for is a solid streaming broadcast for... An official leadership event. Unfortunately, they were to be dis- disappointed. Now let's get to it. Every candidate got a short opening statement. Uh, almost all of them used those moments to take shots at Daniel Smith. This isn't unexpected. I mean, a perceived front runner is always going to take the most flack in these events. And Danielle used her opening to clarify her stance on cancer prevention as she knew it was going to be coming up, and it certainly did. 
It is during the body of the debate, though, where the candidates trying to pull down Smith really blew it. With seven candidates in the race, it's tough for contenders to stand out in the crowd in a debate. Organizers tried to model a format where each candidate got to respond to one issue in question, then they could choose another candidate to debate with them on that issue, and they get four more minutes. It was a way to encourage one-on-one -on -one debates rather than having seven voices shouting over each other or taking half an hour per subject because, you know, if you go through seven people, it's just not going to work. So, I mean, Rajan Sani was asked about the environment. She used the moment to attack Daniel Smith on her proposed Sovereignty Act. And then Sani then, this is the interesting part, chose Smith as the one to debate for the next four minutes. Later on, Rebecca Schulz got her moment, and she got a question on how Alberta could stand up to Ottawa. Schulz spoke on how she was able to work collaboratively with Justin Trudeau's government on the daycare policy that was implemented within Alberta. And then she as well chose Smith as the one to debate for the next four minutes. Now, Daniel Smith is arguably the most skilled orator in the entire field of candidates. She has decades of media and political experience. She relished every moment she could take the microphone. And for the first half of the debate, she was on deck for 80% of the show because the candidates kept pulling her into the mix. Sonny came across as rather weak and spent most of the entirety of the debate trying to find ways to take shots at Smith. Smith was unruffled and just kept taking advantage of the opportunities Sonny gave her to expand further on points of her platform that were considered contentious. Schultz, though, she made the worst strategic make of all, mistake of all when she gave Smith four minutes to debate on provincial federal relations. I mean, Schultz was a cabinet minister in a party establishment that lost the support of its members, much of it due to their inaction in dealing with Ottawa. The issue is the, the weakest spot for Schultz and the strongest spot for Smith. It was the worst choice to debate Smith on this. Smith mopped the floor with Schultz as she took advantage of the chance to expand further on her Sovereignty Act while Schultz was on the defensive for her own government's inaction. Smith was tossed a soft bye by Schultz, softball, and she, she must have been thrilled with the gift. Subsequent candidates, I think, realized the error in putting questions to Smith, and they finally started choosing others, such as Sonny, as their debate opponents, but it was too late. Smith owned the first half of the debate, and due to the crappy feed, the debate had probably lost half its viewers by the second half anyways. And Brian Jean took a strong stance in saying we need constitutional change and that Canada's broken, but of course that requires a crisis as a catalyst, and uh, it plays right into Smith's proposed Sovereignty Act. In her closing statement, Smith addressed every other candidate and complimented them on their stances rather than speaking about herself. She finished the night appearing to be on the high road while a flustered pack of competing candidates made little impression upon the viewers. Smith didn't run away with the debate. The ch candidates challenging Smith gave it to her. There are still months left in the campaign, and there's going to be other debates, including the one held by the Western Standard on August 9th. The candidates playing catch-up with Smith still have time to change tactics and try to draw the interest of the members. So far, though, they've been nothing but reactive, and Smith is taking off with things. While all of them say Smith's proposed Sovereignty Act isn't feasible, none of them are presenting feasible alternatives to dealing with Ottawa, aside from doing more of the same. That already failed. Members are sick and tired of strongly worded letters and panels that do nothing but talk about issues. A Sovereignty Act might fail for Albertans, but the current course of action from the UCP is guaranteed to fail. We know that. Establishment politicians and media members are aghast at Smith's momentum, and they're shooting at her from all sides, but it's not working. She's found a populist niche, and she's effectively filling it. If the contenders for the UCP race can't propose effective alternatives to Smith's plan, she's going to walk away with this race this fall. Well, that was my interpretation of last night's debate. So uh, let's get to Mr. Dave Naylor, our news editor, and see what else is going on out there. Corey, you old dog, you. I'm, uh, I'm coming out to your place right after work. We're going to make us some honey. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jane <laughs> sent me a picture of what it's like to, uh, uh, you know, to be a beekeeper around your place. Uh, you know, hopefully oh, Nico did she can, now? Yeah, she did. Hopefully Nico can bring up the photo. <laughs> Oh, uh, we'll but, uh, see. It, it was it, it was basically uh, three bikini clad women uh, all around, uh, you know, with the honeybees and making honey and uh, all that sort of stuff. I didn't realize that was uh, what was going on out there. Well, I think that was actually my proposed beekeeping plan. Oh, there we go. And uh, that was the course I wanted to take. And actually, that's the one that Jane rejected. I'm not allowed to learn how to beekeep from those those uh, those, uh, you know, apiary managing uh, young ladies and, and I'm afraid I have to stay with suited old men like myself but uh, it is a fine yeah. picture showing just how, how passive those, those bees can be 
Yeah, and uh, for those of us who are just listening on the podcast, it's uh, it's a picture of uh, three uh, very lovely young ladies in bikinis holding up a uh, honeycomb. Uh, yeah, this beekeeping stuff looks like uh, looks like a good time, Corey. But you got to be good, careful, yeah. right? I mean, if you're wearing a speedo, they could uh, they could bite something important. Well, thankfully, you know, when I do that, I mean, the important stuff is still a small target. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not at too much risk that way. But there's still parts of me I'd rather not be stung. No, oh, but if you get stung, it could enlarge itself. <laughs> I guess it would do that. Well, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a picture if such a tragedy occurs. There you go. Uh, we got lots of good uh, news happening this morning, Corey. Uh, uh, the federal government, you remember, uh, has... Uh, put in a, a mandatory gun buyback program for what they call the, you know, the nasty looking assault rifles. A uh, price list was kind of put out today for, for some of them where there's the government is going to pay uh, just about a little bit over $1,300 for the average AR type weapon and up to uh, to $6,000 for, for some of the others. Uh, we, we've talked to your friend, Tony Bernardo with the uh, uh, CCSA, is it? Uh, CSSA. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, you'll be talking about them later, I'm sure. And he's not very happy with this. He says, you know, how can you put a, a single price on a, on a type of gun that has so many different uh, varieties? So while the full list hasn't been published yet, Corey, uh, we are sort of starting to get, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of a guideline on what the Liberals are going to do. And there's no doubt it's going to end up uh, being a billion-dollar uh, boondoggle. Your Western Standard uh, readers will remember Mel Risden's piece a couple of weeks ago where we reported that... Uh, the, the highest cause of death in uh, in Alberta at the moment is unexplained causes. And uh, Mark Stein did a bit of a rant on that on uh, British TV yesterday. Uh, and it's very interesting, very fun. Uh, I uh, encourage all the readers to uh, to take a look at that. Uh, Tamara Leach came to mind this morning, Corey, when we heard of details of an Edmonton man charged with uh, six counts of child luring and and talking the the kids into performing sex acts and and basically getting their personal information and extorting them. Well, despite all these serious charges, he was less he was in jail less than a couple of hours, and he'd already gotten bail and he's already uh, he's already back out there. So you know you think of uh, poor Tamara Leach sitting in uh, in an Ottawa hellhole for months, and it just shows you how politically driven that uh, that uh, story is. And uh, Alberta government responding this morning to growing cases of uh, monkeypox. Uh, they've set up a, a vaccination program for men who are in the uh, the, uh, the danger zone uh, who could uh, who could get it. So uh, those are just some of the stories we've got up this morning, Corey. Uh, our intern, we've got in, young intern Jonathan. He's out from Ontario. Uh, he'll be working on his story. He's, he's just busy at the moment, uh, getting my dry cleaning and detailing my car. But when he is done with that, he'll have a story on uh, Dallas Cowboys owner uh, uh, Jerry Jones has got himself in hot water with the, uh, the the woke crowd because he dared to use the word midget. And uh, that caused a uh, uproar in the United States, and he's had to apologize it. So, uh, yeah, as soon as uh, Jonathan's finished grabbing my lunch and, uh, uh, you know, doing all that sort of good stuff, uh, he'll have that uh, for us. Well, great. I'm looking forward to seeing the protests outside of the, you know, Cowboys Stadium with all those little people running around. I, I mean, they, you know, they can't help it, but they're always entertaining. They are. There's nothing better than a good midget wrestling match. Oh, I and, uh, you know, I'm sure in the heydays of when you were uh, uh, owning your bar, Corey, I'm sure Thursday, wasn't Thursday night's dwarf tossing night? And they banned it before I bought the bar, but I did watch and attend a few of those way back in the days of Electric Avenue, where yes, you would take a, a, a middle a little person or a midget, as was allowed to be said then. And yeah, they put a little football helmet on them and throw that little devil as, as far as they could. Uh, drunks would, uh, it, it was quite an event. And uh, those guys would make quite a bit of money out of that. Though I, I can agree, yeah. maybe it might've been a bit humiliating. Yeah, but you know, if they're willing to do it and they got paid and they probably had a few beers themselves, uh, might've all been in good fun back then. But uh, oh, yeah. it's a definitely, definitely a no-no now. No. Well, we'll we'll look forward to that story from Jonathan. All okay, right, Corey. Thanks. thanks. I'll talk to you after the show. So that is our news editor, Dave Naylor. As we see, we've got Dave. We've got reporters all across the country. We've got interns. Jonathan's working on things once he gets out from under that car and detailing and fixing things up under there. And he's hammering out those stories. And the reason we can do that. We do pay the interns, just uh, not as much as other people do sometimes. Or I don't know how that intern thing works out. Either way, 
The reason we've got all these people on board is because of subscribers. That's how we stay independent. That's how we are not like the legacy media outlets that are beholden to the government that take tax dollars. It's subscribers and thousands of them come through. It's been fantastic uh, for a publication that's kind of only been revitalized for a year and a half now. It is or two and a half years now. It's really taking off. So thank you to everybody who subscribed. And this is when I got to nag and remind you, if you're watching this and you haven't subscribed yet, 99 bucks a year, $10 a month. It's a good deal, guys. We're not asking for charity. We're asking you to buy a service. It's less than a newspaper subscription used to cost, less than some people spend on World of Warcraft, and you get good product right through the paywall and uh, get lots of info. So get on there, westernstandard.news slash membership, and take one out. And uh, yeah, we appreciate it. I'm going to answer some questions. Uh, Cameron Freckleton, a commenter, says, Western Standard, what are your thoughts on candidate Lowen? Uh, you know, this has been interesting since this leadership race began. And I, I, I imagine, you know, it's a, it's a perfectly good question there, Cameron. You say Western Standard. You see that the standard itself does not have a stance. That That's, you know, once in a while we do take editorial stances and we will have a meeting. And we would put out a piece where, you know, there'd be discussions between Derek and Dave and myself and others on an editorial stance. But in general, on something, say, as a specific candidate, we wouldn't. What you can get and will get is my view on candidate Lowen or other issues or, or other races and things like that, because this is an opinion show. And, and some people have been um, confused a bit by it lately, actually. I've been getting some of that, some interesting stuff as I've been commenting on the race. Things get heated in races. You know, people are very attached to their candidates. They're passionate about it. And they get upset whenever their candidate is criticized. I will celebrate or criticize any candidate when they do something right or wrong. Uh, I think Danielle did really well in the, in the the debate last night, so I was complimentary of it. If I thought she crapped the bed, I would have reported on it that way. I'll take it as I see it and as it comes. Todd, I've known him actually for quite a long time. We, we were together in the Wild Rose Party in the past. He's, he's a fantastic person. He's, he stands in a good spot in that party at least. Uh, I know some folks got uh, annoyed when I sort of, and fair enough, I kind of implied he was part of the establishment because he holds a seat within the party. But uh, he is sort of outside the establishment in that, yeah, he spoke up and he got uh, kicked out of caucus for his views and he stands by his principles. Part of my issue is I, I, with, with Todd is that he's not standing out with a strong stance on Ottawa and he speaks up, absolutely. But when you looked at his website, all I could find was a little bit of a thing on carbon taxes and, and nothing really solid. And it, it's not to say he doesn't have those views. They're just not being well delivered or encapsulated at this time. And it's making it difficult for him to stand out in a pack of seven candidates. He's doing very well as the campaign goes, so especially one without a party mechanism behind him. And uh, we'll just keep in watching as that develops. And as I started the show, I liked his comments, at least in kind of taking a swipe at the party um, with uh, their, their poor management of that debate. I mean, consider how much money the party demanded out of all of them, and he can't even get a good solid stream when, um, when he uh, is in a debate on it. So uh, let's see what else we got in the comments there. Um, Judy and Jim uh, Jarotowski saying, everyone's saying the Sovereignty Act will work, but won't say why, uh, other than that people are going to flee Alberta. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I'm not worried about that. Yeah, we'll see. I, you know, the, the bottom line is, and that's something that Danielle kept pointing out to them. You know, they're saying, oh, it's going to drive business out. and It's going to harm industry. Look, Ottawa has been doing that to us for decades. There really isn't much to lose in pushing back harder. That, that case holds no water. So uh, they, they've got to come up with something better to push back, I mean, perhaps, as I said, perhaps what Smith is proposing isn't feasible. Well, in that case, come up with what is. Because right now, uh, they're, they're getting thrown to the wayside. The, the party um, establishment, I still think a lot of them don't even realize why their last leader got thrown out. I mean, Kenny was a strong, well-established Albertan politician, you know, who came in as a popular, arguably leader, uh, only a few years ago, and after a few years of inaction on things like the Fair Deal panel and stuff like that, his own membership turned and tossed him out on his butt. And the establishment doesn't seem to understand that. It, you are not going to win the members by saying, we're going to offer you four more years of the same thing that you just got rid of. they got to stand out. they got to sound different. And then, then there's people who might think, I'm going to segue that into my guests here, that there's no fixing the UCP. There's no getting around that. What we need is an entirely different party with a, a full-on different approach, and that's the Wild Rose Independence Party. And they've been a strong registered presence. Uh, they were in that last by-election. They're out there, and 
Well, right now, though, they are doing what we always seem to do with conservative parties, and they're all fighting with each other. So uh, let's bring Paul Hinman in and uh, Angela Tabak and, and try to sort out kind of what's going on with the Wild Rose Independence Party, because uh, they had their EGM last weekend, and it looks like it was quite an exciting time. Hey, guys, how you doing? Doing good, good Corey. Good to see you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I kind of framed that a bit at the start. I'm just going to start with a bit of a ramble to give some people some background if they're not familiar with what's kind of happening in the party, or at least my interpretation of it. Uh, you, you, you kind of had a split between the, the party executive members and, uh, well, the leadership yourself, and I guess almost in a tertiary way in the members themselves. Uh, the, the, the small board uh, of directors essentially, essentially uh, considered you removed as the leader from the party, but it wasn't accepted by the members. Uh, the, the AGM was held last weekend, and uh, the members sort of stood up. The executive committee walked out, and uh, you've been reinstated as leader and, and yourself as, as president. Is that kind of, in a nutshell, what, what's happened here? Yes, that, that, that's a good summary of it, and, and, and you just need to realize is that what we're talking about is a rogue board that, that wants to declare themselves leader forever. Um, you know, they, they manipulated the elections that we we're going to have. They eliminated people who sent in their um, nominations. They didn't disqualify them or let them know to the last minute. Uh, it, it's just really been disheartening to see the way this board of governors, this past board of governors behaved. But it was so exciting to be amongst our members. Uh, to have a great discussion, to have, a, a, a again, a, a democratic process of electing people. And again, I don't know if it was seven hours into the meeting, we still had 83% of the people that were there and voted in, in favor for the new board and for myself as leadership. And, and it was just, it was great to, to end on such a high note. <laughs> Okay, so going into you know, party management and operations and things like that, and for people not familiar with it, that's typically kind of the domain of the, the executive committee and, and the party president. So I'll bring Angela in and kind of ask. Now, you guys are in an odd spot. As I said, I, I did contact Jeevan Mangit just to ask him, trying to find out what's going on from there. Uh, he basically said, go to the Elections Alberta website, and that tells you who runs the party. Well, and that still lists Jeevan and, and Rick Northey. Now, as... The one who's been selected, Angela, as party president, how can you rectify or change that with Elections Alberta? What's the process and what's happening now? Well, we've been talking to them and we're looking at our different options, obviously. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the membership spoke. Um, the old PBOG didn't like it. There are things that they could have done to rectify the situation way before this that they chose not to. And so... I mean, they're basically running a party without any support of the members. So, um, yeah, we're just moving forward. The party spoke. They chose their new uh, their new party board of governors, and we're moving moving forward with that. And, um, yeah, like I said, we have spoken to Elections Alberta. We're looking at different options. Um, but we've got, we've got a message, and we have a movement to bring forward to the people of Alberta. And um, we're just getting busy with that. Okay, but in in the meantime, like who's controlling uh, the email accounts, the the fundraising, the bank? I mean, it, it, until that's resolved, it's going to be very difficult for you guys to organize uh, effectively. Anyways, isn't it? Well, I, we're I would, roots, so we're... I, I, I would I would actually say no, Corey, in that we have some awesome CAs. Angela's got one uh, that are up and running, twenty five to thirty. And they, they can carry on. I mean, one of their complaints for the last year is, is that they, they, they write in or they call in to get the membership from their CA so they can build their CAs. And our, our past board wouldn't send it to them. Oh, no. What do you want to send? Send it to us and we'll send it out. They, they were so, I, I want to say, just obsessed with control that, that our party hasn't been able to move forward. And so we're, we're getting each CA independent. They can donate money and raise money in their CAs. They're looking for candidates that, who want to run. And, and it's actually quite exciting that since the, the AGM now, all of a sudden we're coming together. We've had several Zoom meetings and talking to different CA presidents and people are ready to go forward and go out there and start talking to Albertans. But yes, they currently have the website and they have Nation Builder that we're going to work from one CA to the next, and it's going to be great. Okay, well, uh, I mean, it's an interesting way to work around because, I mean, the, the election is approaching. We're less than a year from it. You're going to need candidates in place. You're going to need funds. You're going to need campaign planning. Uh, 
I mean, still in the end, the, the party will have to resolve that. I guess that's going to take a little time. Uh, I mean, you know, things can't happen overnight. Do you, do you think this might go to the courts? Well, I, I, I sure hope not. I mean, let, let, let's sit back and, and have, you know, have some reason here. Just watch the, you know, it, it's all up on YouTube. Uh, Wild Rose AGM 2022. It's very plain what happened. The people spoke. And, you know, one of the hallmarks of a good democracy is, is that the, the peaceful turnover to a new you know, to the new group. And, and these people are, are again, just showing their, their colors, um, full colors in that they're, they're authoritarians, they, they want control and they refuse to let go. And they very much for the three months leading up to the AGM went through all of this, you know, they didn't allow us to have a policy and governance policy where, where the members had submitted. It, it's just really been disappointing their behavior. But like I say, time, time is on our side, truth on our side. And I do believe that they'll come to reason and realize, you know, um, I guess we need to go join with the other groups that they say that this is where we need to be, that they're free to go and join. There's two or three other groups that, that are claiming to be independent groups and they, they, they want to be with them. Then please uh, pull up your uh, stakes and go over and join them. Well, it's a, a tough field out there. I mean, what was interesting, I believe it was about 400 members showed up. Uh, that's a, a sizable number for a, a, a smaller party to get rolling. I mean, I know, I think Paul and I have attended AGMs in past parties where we'd have like 80 or 90 people. And yep. we still, I mean, over time, turned that into the official opposition in Alberta. So uh, 400 people is not something to, to sneeze at, to, especially in summer when people have things they feel might be better to do. Um, of those, as you said, the majority, and we can see that in the video online, did say that they wanted to elect a new board. So uh Angela, you're, you're the, the, the one that the, the group there chose as president. There's others on this new uh, executive committee, I imagine, as well. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a great team. Um, tons of different experience and backgrounds that we're bringing different um, skills to, to the group. And um, yeah, very cohesive. Like it's a very different field than what we've been dealing with for the last year. Um, as a CA president for the last 14 months, I've had zero support from the old party board of governors. And basically we've been running CAs on our own without that support. So um, yeah, we've got a long list of things that, that we know that we need to put in place to help the CAs be effective and uh, successful in their, their bid to find candidates and, and to get things moving. And we're super excited, tons of energy, tons of energy and um, just a real commitment to the principles of Wild Rose. It's grassroots. We want to hear from the CA presidents. We want to hear from the membership. We've set up online things where just any member can go online and they can give us all kinds of ideas and, and what their thoughts are. Um, and uh, it's, it's bottom up, not top down, which is what we have been experiencing. Yeah, so you got lots to do in, in limited time. Do you think, is, is there going to be another event or anything going on, like a larger part of gathering between now and election time? Uh, maybe oh, a, yeah. a chance to resolve some more things or something like that? Yeah, well, absolutely. We're, we're, yeah, we're going to get pushing forward. And, and again, we'll, we'll hold probably a special general meeting so that we can bring forward the policies and bylaws that the members already submitted and wanted to vote on. But bottom line, we want to start doing town halls, going around the province and, and working in the different CAs to let people know that we actually do have a, a solution that's much better than the Sovereignty Act, which, which is, again, going, going into their courts and asking for permission. Hey, will you make us supreme over you? Um, we, we have a better result or better plan than that, that than what they're doing. But um, it's, it's good to see people coming on board and following Danielle the way they are, because that that's certainly a step in the great direct in the right direction. We're thrilled that they're imitating so many of our policies. They just got two or three more to go, and um, we're we're doing great. Yeah, well, yeah. That's something you always have been something of a pragmatist. You got in trouble for that with your endorsement of uh, Ted Morton, I believe, many years ago. Yeah. Uh, the bottom line is, I mean, it doesn't matter who gets the job done. It's just got to get done. So, uh, but you're, you're you're basically, I mean, you're there saying if the UCP doesn't do it, you're, you're going to. Well, I think they're actually following us and even Danielle, you know, like, like she's by far, in my opinion, the best of the pack, the only one in the pack that's going to stand up or, or make an attempt to Ottawa. But this idea to say that we're going to pass legislation and we're going to go out to Ottawa and say, hey, we want you to make our legislation supreme over your legislation. 
um, that, that that's like asking for permission for something you know they're going to say no and then you're in a lost position. Whereas with the Wild Rose and what we're proposing is that we actually talk to the people the next election, they're going to be able to answer, do you want to have our own police force? Do you want to have our own tax system where we collect all the taxes by Albertans, for Albertans? Are we going to have our own environmental regulations? We're not going to listen to Ottawa. And you actually need to present that to the people when they elect us. We actually have our mandate from the people on the things we campaigned about. And perhaps the two most important things where they're not there yet is, is if we want better government than the legacy parties, we have to have accountability. You have to be able to fire your elected representatives any day, 24-7, 365 days of the year. And this idea that once every four years is good enough, look what Rachel did to us. Look what Notley did to us. I mean, what um, Kenny did to us. And you can go back to Redford and all of these other ones. It, it doesn't work. But most important for Alberta, um, the Paris Accord and carbon net zero um, does not work for us, doesn't work for the world. And for Danielle to, to say that, oh, we're going to meet carbon net zero and we can do all these innovative things if we're taxed so heavily, um, that's a no-go. We, we need zero carbon tax. We need to have the ability to develop and sell our resources to the world. They need more Alberta oil. It's ethical. It's clean. And, and it's just the way to go. And we need to stand up and say no to Ottawa. And we need a mandate from the people to say no, and we'll exercise our full autonomy. Well, great. Well, I mean, it's certainly a distinct stance, and, and you're there and, and putting that out. So maybe just in closing, I guess, with, with Angela, because there is just a, where can people find information on the party, keep up with it? I mean, there's kind of multiple uh, sources going on right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Where could you direct people if they're looking to find more information or contact you guys? So we are getting that up and running. Um, yeah, I mean, we're five days out from the AGM. Uh, so we are scrambling and we will have that that out quickly um, and shortly here. Um, the CA presidents and the CA boards are reaching out to their current members right now to um, establish contact and to let them know. Well, they've had contact already before, but to just let them know, hey, we're still here and um, we're still moving forward with this movement. And frankly, the uh, sovereignty movement in Alberta is in a much better position today than it was last week at this time because of what happened at the AGM. All right. Well, thanks for coming on to, to speak to us today about some of that and uh, try and unmuddy the waters uh, a little bit. Anyways, I know there's a lot of you. I mean, you can just see it on the YouTube video. And I do I suggest other people go and have a look for yourselves. I mean, there's interpretations, there's views, but I mean, that was it was all covered. You can see what, what happened and, and make up your own determination on what's going on. I think it's important to have uh, alternative parties out there giving a good message out there, you know, uh, I, when we come election time. And it's unfortunate to see uh, parties dedicating so much time to fighting within themselves rather than, uh, you know, getting established for an election. So I hope it's all resolved fairly soon and uh, look forward to talking to you guys then. One, one last thing, Corey, being the person who I am and sticking my neck out when I'm not supposed to. But we're, we're going to be going back to our old website, wildrose.party www.wildrose.party. If, if this rogue board doesn't turn over and, and do the honorable thing, um, we'll, we'll start up that and people can start looking there. www.wildrose.party. And that, that'll probably be where we end up because it looks like they're, they're going to uh, dig in and not want to do the right thing. Okay, well, thanks, WildRose.Party, and uh, we'll keep an eye on it, Paul and Angela. So, uh, well, good luck with your endeavors, and we'll, we'll talk to you again, I'm sure. Thanks, thanks for having us on. Really appreciate the work you're doing. Hey, thanks, Paul. Okay, so that was the, uh, well, I, I believe the leader and president of the Wild Rose Independence Party. Uh, it, it's it's unfortunately gotten messy, but it, you know, a lot of clarity can be found in watching that video of the AGM. I mean, a lot of stuff's sort of dry. I'll tell you, if you're just somebody looking out of curiosity, as, as far as uh, uh, AGMs go, that was pretty lively, actually, though, and in an unfortunate way. And uh, you can certainly see the range. Uh, we did a story on that in the clip with the, uh, uh, I guess, other or former president or whatever, it might be Rick Northey storming out of the room and, and elbowing a gentleman on the way out the door. It certainly demonstrated how heated things have got in that room. But most of what got to me, and I'm just going to give my interpretation, is the members are paramount. That's always the chief and final authority. And what really rose the alarm bells with me when this was building up a couple of months ago and getting going was this board just did everything in their power to make sure that their questions, whether perhaps Paul did do something wrong in the by-election, I don't know. I don't think so. There's laws about that. But if he did, 
you're only a few weeks away from an AGM, that's the time to say, hey, this is our concern. The members are here today. Let's talk about it and resolve it. But instead, they wanted to bypass that, kick out the leader, and just not even give him a, a chance to address the membership and say what the heck's going on. And that raises the alarm bells with me. And, and they obviously, when they had the members there, 400 of them, they couldn't make their case. And the room turned on them. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a messy way to do things. But it was the closest I can see to where you can get as many members in one spot as possible and have a raise of hands and say, which way do we want to go? And the majority of them said, we want to go with our leader and elect a new board. Now, that leads to a lot of complications. Like, I, I, I know, and they're working on that, I guess. And that's up to them. As Josh Andrews is saying, he says, so Elections Alberta hasn't recognized Paul's leader, uh, nor has recognized the new board. Well, not necessarily, actually. you got to remember, as, as was stated, this was only five days ago. And the way it works is you've got to submit your meeting and your minutes and all sorts of stuff to Elections Alberta. Presumably, usually it's pretty easy because there's not much dispute. There's only going to be one board saying that they're running it. And Elections Alberta will update their site to reflect those sorts of things. But if you've got a former board refusing to cooperate, and you can have some difficulties, and unfortunately, it, it might end up with legal action. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. That's, I'm outside of that uh, realm. But, I mean, it's going to be resolved. So it's not saying that they haven't recognized. They're just saying, you know, basically, I think that they've got to get some, some clarity uh, brought to them. I mean, Elections Alberta, of all the government organizations I've ever dealt with, actually, I, I think they, they, they've always been fantastic. They work very hard to remain as unbiased as possible. They don't want to get in the middle of a partisan mess. They got their rules, they got their registration, they just want to put things out there how they can. So we'll see how things come together, I guess, in the next while and, and if there's resolution. But as I said, I would uh, suggest people watch that, that video and, and, and perhaps past interviews with Paul and uh, Rick Northy. I had him on the show uh, a couple of months ago. and or no, It wasn't even a couple of months, I think it was a month maybe. And, and uh, you know, determine things from there. But uh, I, I always hate seeing parties. You know, again, it's, it's time wasted. It's, it's when you're fighting with yourself, you're losing ground on the battle you wanted to have. And uh, sometimes it's unavoidable, I guess, but uh, it's, it's, it's an unfortunate development. All right, I see some questions again from uh, Freckleton and Shirley and Sylvia, all again asking, you got to run around on the answer about whether or not Todd's going to be in the debate. Come on, guys, we've addressed this 10 times over, but I'll address it again. We did it... Uh, actually at length last night uh, during the pipeline. I know not everybody gets to watch every show. We have a debate going uh, in early August there, and it's, it's going to be hosted by the Western Standard. It's in a venue that really literally physiologically only has room for three people on the stage. Plus a seven-person debate, as we saw last night, is very difficult to manage. It, it, it's hard to get through that. And realistically, we wanted to at least pick what appeared to be the top three and give them that, that, that spot. You know, the other four, we certainly give all the time we can and everything, but that's, and re, with polling out there, look, between Danielle Smith, Brian Jean, and, uh, and Taves, Travis Taves, we're talking, I, I, I'm just guessing here, it was like 23%, 24%, and 15%. Once you got beyond that, the other candidates, I mean, everybody else was, with, and this is broad polling, this is from, uh, a polling organization, not the Western Standard little online poll on a website. That's not an accurate poll. I mean, it's a poll of our members, and we do those to get a feel of things. But this broader polling, every other candidate we're talking is like 1% or 2%. If we're going to look at three that are definitely, at least as far as we can tell, the top three contenders, those three stand out. And that's why those three were selected. It's nothing against the other four. It's saying we had to come up with a method to make a, a smaller number of people participating in it. And that's the way we went. And uh, that's, that's where things go from there. Um, and, and again, Josh, uh, so Paul hasn't been recognized as a legitimate signing authority. It's still in dispute is, is the way it is. And I, I don't see, I don't see how elections Alberta isn't going to recognize them eventually. It's just, unfortunately, if the outgoing board is intransigent, it could take a couple of months before it's resolved. But I don't know how 10 people in a room of 400 can think they have any moral authority to run that party anymore. I mean, really, it, it, it was just uh, beyond the pale. I mean, at some point you have to realize maybe you're on the wrong side if you're going to claim to be a member-driven party. If you've got a valid case to be made, you should have nothing to fear in having that case put out in front of a whole room. 
And they that seemed to be what they fought the most. I mean, from what I heard, they even uh, got to the point of trying to call security when Paul came in to keep him out from the room. Really, they were that terrified of Paul. We're going to call security rather than let him come into the room. And the members basically told security he's staying. So in the end of all this mess, I, I'm pretty confident this is going to land back with, with, with Paul and the new president. But they're going to waste a whole lot of time and resources and energy having to get that resolved. That's uh, unfortunate. Um, so let's see. We will see what comes out of it. But as I said, I mean, I, I, I just want to see more of those options out there. I like seeing that um, uh, ability, you know, for another option for, for, for members with the UCP. I mean, if uh, and it should temper the, the views then of, of ones like Taves, establishment candidates such as him, Scholes. Hey, if you guys keep that soft sell with Ottawa, there's another door for people. There's somewhere people are going to go. So the UCP members are going to have to think carefully on that. The candidates are going to have to think carefully on that. It's your competitors can sometimes drive the game. It's the up and comers. If you're leaving a void to be filled, they're going to fill it. So these other parties are important. If, if the Wild Rose Independence Party wasn't there, then the UCP might feel more comfortable in taking more soft st sell stances with Ottawa, which fail, chronically fail, failed for decades. So I do not want to see the Wild Rose Independence Party disappear. And uh, I don't think it's going to. I don't think it's going to disappear. I just think, though, that they're losing a lot of traction, unfortunately, over all of this uh, uh, you know, infighting. And uh, it'll get resolved eventually, but... Uh, you know, time's getting wasted, and uh, it's unfortunate. So let's see what else we got in the comments here. Uh, others for Todd Lowen. Okay, Josh, I don't know what you're hung up with here. <laughs> okay, if it isn't legally recognized, how can it be legitimate? It isn't legally recognized yet. Yet. There was a meeting with 400 members that voted, and we got 10 who had the original prior authority trying to fight against the 400, basically, or 300 of them or whatever. This will get ironed out and it will be recognized, but it's not today. It was only been five days. So, uh, and uh, the, the meeting, I think, was, in my view, I mean, we'll see, that's up to others, you know, legitimate. That you've got the members gathered, they made up their mind. They run the party. It's their party. And, and uh, that's what happened. Uh, let's see, uh, referendum on independence, somebody wants to see, yes. I'm kind of mixed on that. Um, Josh, I, I keep getting that comment over. So, Josh, if you keep putting the same one up, I'm going to block your comments. Like, seriously, I've answered it. All right. So, uh, yes, we've got things going on. Let's see what else is happening in the uh, questions here. I understand. I don't want to get fighting over it on there. Um, and and again, Josh, for the tenth time, it's five days since the AGM. That's why Elections Alberta hasn't changed anything yet. So, uh, where else are we going here, guys? Let's let's talk about our uh, uh, sponsor. <laughs> I got to get to that. The Canadian Shooting Sports Association. It's not just members that help pay, pay our bills, guys. It is our sponsors. And the CSSA, the Canadian Shooting Sports Association, has uh, been a great sponsor for us, and they're a great organization. Look, their name kind of says what it's about. It's an association of people who own firearms, collect firearms, use them for hunting, target shooting, whatever you want, law-abiding citizens. And these are people that are under attack, that are constantly having their property under threat, and uh, they got to stand up for themselves. The only way you can do that, you can send your letter as an individual. You can, you know, call your MP. You can do what you want. But unless you organize together, as I said, that's one of the areas I only, you know, give the left credit. I don't tend to if I can help it. But they organize. They know their safety in numbers when it comes to their causes. And an association like the Canadian Shooting Sports Association is the way that firearm owners can get together and work as a group to protect their rights. And these guys have been around for a long, long time. They are effective. Tony Bernardo has been running them. He's a fantastic spokesperson for people who want to responsibly enjoy firearms. And if you want to keep the right to do that, guys, you've got to get on board with these guys. The membership fees are modest, but this is the way you protect yourself. Because if you don't stand up for your own rights, they will get taken away from you. We have a government more than eager to take away your rights. So get on there, guys. It's the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. That's the easiest way to find them. You know, Just Google it and they'll pop up. 
or their website is cssa-cila.org. Take out a membership. Their costs aren't that much, and uh, it's an investment in yourself and your own rights. So, all right, let's see what else we got uh, going on in the comment scroll before I get on to some news items, if there's more. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> contentious issues get going when we get to... Uh, uh, party uh, things going on, and, and we'll see. Uh, you know, some people are confident this is going to go to court. I doubt it. Look, <laughs> I, I I interviewed Rick Norphy. Uh, you know, you can look back and check that out. This is the the, the former, and I'm going to call it that in my view, former president of that party. He wouldn't answer questions. He was angry. He was belligerent, and he didn't make a good case. I, if he's going to, he had the same opportunity in front of all of the members last weekend. And obviously, they didn't have any use for his case either. Uh, the interim leader, Jeevan Mangat, and I've known Jeevan a long time. I like him, but he's basically being incommunicado. He just told me, oh, go look at the, the Elections Alberta site. Okay. Uh, guys, I mean, unless your goal is to run the party into the ground, uh, I, I, this won't win in court, but they can really cost a lot of resources going there. I, I don't know what they think they're uh, achieving, but uh, we'll find out. Uh, Steve Britton saying regarding re referendum, we aren't trying to pull a Quebec. We want to win it rather than try to push for a different arrangement. Yeah, like, well, that's one of the things I've talked about before a number of times. And I, I think I differ a bit from Paul because he's talked about uh, referendums going to one right away. And, and so is Drew Barnes, you know, and I've had them on the show. And I mean, hey, I'm an independent supporter. But one thing I, I've said over and over again, we aren't ready for a referendum. We are not ready. There's, there's two things. For one, <sighs> We don't even have our own provincial house in order. As we said, we're in the middle of a leadership race because we checked out our own premier. And uh, that's not going to give people confidence to say we're going to be better off on our own. The other thing is, uh, if we hold a referendum and lose, you're not going to get another chance for a decade. So if you really want to push for one, you really have to feel confident that there is support for that sort of move at this time. It at least has to be a strong, strong showing or that, uh, or or an actual vote to go. But right now, I mean, even the strongest polling for s support for independence in Alberta shows about 33%, which is bloody strong. When you got a third of the province saying, you know what, we're better off out, uh, that you know, some people should be sitting up and taking notice. I mean, and those are also motivated voters. But I also know from working on past election campaigns, it's one thing for a person to make a check mark on a poll, or you know, when they got a phone call coming in to say, yes, I support independence, when they actually go into a polling booth. Uh, they often change their mind. I mean, it's something they say when they're ticked off. It's something they push for at the time. But when push comes to shove, they really aren't quite ready for that leap yet. And I don't think anywhere close to 50% of Albertans are ready for that leap yet. I think it's going to come. I think we're going to come with so many standoffs with Ottawa and Trudeau with his insane green plans and his, his attacks on fertilizer and energy and you name it. I mean, again, independence looks a lot nicer when suddenly you can't make the mortgage and can't put food on your table. But for the time being, calling for a referendum right now, I think, is premature and uh, could actually defeat the purpose of what you want to go towards. A little patience. And I know that's not one of my stronger suits. I mean, that's why I ran the Alberta Independence Party when I was 29 and thought, we got to go out right now. Well, look at that. It's 20 years later. We're no closer. So uh, just got to hold the horses, guys, and, and figure out how we're going to do it. And part of it is that we're always eager to go, but we haven't built our framework and uh, how to get uh into that position to get there. All right, let's pivot a bit. I see our, our next guest is in the lobby already, and I'd like to talk to him. I'm looking forward to that. And that is our, uh, he's a, a week, been a weekly columnist for the Western Standard lately. His name is Trevor Tucker. He's from out there in the East Land, and uh, he's been writing some great stuff, and I want to expand on it. So, hey, Trevor, uh, welcome back to the show. I think we had you on once before a couple of months ago, but we're due to see you again. Yeah, great. Good to see you, Corey. I wish so I could have not. I wish I could have chimed in on that last discussion too, man. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's it's worthy of discussing and writing on as well, right? The the perils of party politics, and when you start letting personalities and and individual agendas and things get rolling, uh, you know, you, you can destroy what 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 you've been working on uh, quite quickly if you're not careful. And we're seeing quite a mess going on over there right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a great uh, guy on YouTube. He's a historian named uh, JJ McCullough, and yes. um, he's. Have you seen his his stuff on the the I, brain? I have. He does a lot of great short stuff. I love it. Very yeah. good cutting comments. Yes. 
Yeah, and he's really spoken up on the censorship bill and stuff too. But but his uh, his take on you know how Canada has failed in keeping the French in, keeping the Americans out, and I forget what the other one is. Uh, and and then and then he sort of plots you know that how how the country could possibly break up, which is yeah. Um, we seem to, we seem to you know every couple decades right we seem to go through this again. But uh, yeah, a lot of things are secular. They they, they really are. I, what I feel right now is we're actually sitting kind of on a part of a 40 year cycle. When we look, we've got another Trudeau in, we got interest rates starting to shoot up, we got inflation running rampant, we got high energy prices. Uh, boy, but the last time that cycle happened, we got hit with a national energy program. I, I hope this, this trend doesn't continue or, or we could have a lot of problems pretty soon. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, I mean, to, to kind of come back to why we're Come on, you know it, it does seem that this this time around that, that you know the the sort of lack of um, I don't know public ownership I guess in in terms of taking responsibility for ourselves. It seems, I live in Ontario, you know it seems that kind of at an all time uh, low, and and we're just we're just fine with letting the the government control the food supply and and. And, and on down. So who knows where, where this could go? Well, yeah. And, th and that's what the, the last piece we put up where we're basically, uh, you talked about, you know, how the government's kind of ceded the care of our neighbors to the government or the government has, we have as citizens. And, and that's a trend, a broader trend we've seen, I think throughout the developed world, you know, we just, we, we take everything for granted that the government can take care of it. If there's ever a problem, we call on the government. I mean, it used to be, if your neighbor had a problem, you went and knocked on his door and say, how to look and see if you could help or if it was a broader problem you might join a charity or or your church group might uh, take part in that but now everything is getting handed to government and and it's not working out well for us uh no <laughs> no it's not it's not and and uh yeah i mean i i, I mean obviously there's 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 a lot of reasons for it but you know um I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that the government loves it. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a communications prof and I, I do in, in propaganda and, and, and this kind of stuff. And, you know, you, you, you break up the family, you break up the church, you break up communities and you've got them. Um, and, and, you know, those really, I think, should be where the, you know, the sort of strong bonds need to be kind of, you know, held on to and, and sustained. And then, okay, so let the government do their thing, but they should be kind of in the background, not, you know, sort of, uh, sort of out front and us, of course, relying on them uh, for everything. Um, I, you know, we, we, we here, uh, 10 years ago from, from Ottawa, from Canada, actually, and, and it's, and it's been quite an education, um, moving to a rural area um, because, you know, you really do start to get a sense of, of that divide, um, you know, where, where out here it's like, do it yourself. And, and uh, uh, you know, people just, you know, back off government. I I'd written about this stuff before um, in, in, uh, in, in living in Canada, but um, yeah. And, and I, I don't know about, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm curious about the Alberta thing, but, but, um, do you see that same kind of divide out there? People in the city are fine to just just kind of comply and 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 stay safe, um, whereas people in rural areas are 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 more sort of um, tighter and more self sustaining as as a community. Most definitely, and I, I, my wife and I got to do a recent example ourselves. We were in Calgary for for thirty years, uh, you know, each I guess you could say respectively, and uh, we moved to uh, uh, Pritis, which is just a, a little community, rural, just outside of the city though, and in, into the foothills a little bit. And mm -hmm. we took part in the, the community association up in Highland Park in North Calgary. And I tell you, to try and get 10 volunteers into a room was next to impossible, even though, though you had such a large, dense population. I mean, there were some fantastic people in the community who worked very hard, but mm -hmm. it's such a small number and it was difficult to keep things rolling. And then now down in Pritis, uh, just last, week I was uh was it two weeks ago we were at uh, the annual pancake breakfast there and we had, we almost had too many volunteers the coordinator didn't know what to do with everybody showing up to flip pancakes and pull out tables and we've got other things like we've got a whatsapp group with all of our neighbors if there's a crime or something in the area 
we'll rush down the road to help out. Or if we see smoke coming up, we'll head down there and see if there's a, a fire to be put out. And yeah. it, we take it upon ourselves to take care of our neighbors and each other. And that attitude was not in the city, uh, very much less. It was always, well, call 311 or, or call 911, not, not do anything yourself. And I, I think that trends everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, the, the, the anecdote I always use is you know, my aunt, she's, she's 82. And if she hears that there's a funeral in town, she's there. Uh, and she's there because she knows the cousin of the cousin of the, you know, and, and it's just, it's what you always do. It's, it's so deeply ingrained in, in her, in her upbringing that, that it's just non-negotiable. Um, she doesn't drive. She'll, she'll get anyone she can to, to take her to this funeral. I've even been dragged along a few times, um, you know, but, but this, yeah, this, this kind of stuff, um, and I mean, thankfully, we, we felt quite blessed to be out here in, in the middle of the pandemic stuff, too, because you, you almost forget it, um, that it's that it's going on until you go into the city. Um, and, and uh, you know, whereas out here, people are kind of like, yeah, well, you know, you do what you need to do and we're, we're all good. Um, yeah, well, and I mean, I, I think if things really sick, you know, go in a cycle and go very bad, I mean, we're moving into a recession. Pretty much every economist is agreeing on that right now. We're, we're going to see some harder economic times, hopefully not catastrophically so, but mm. if it goes very, very bad, uh, I think a lot of people are going to hopefully rediscover just how important a tight local community is in, in, in helping each other out because the government can't save you when that happens. Yeah. Uh, and, and the rural communities are going to have a, a much better time of things than the city ones where people have become so introverted and dependent on the, on the government. And, and it doesn't have to be, as I said, that small yeah. hall we were at in Calgary, there were still some very dedicated community members and there is in every community, but not nearly as, as tightly. So you couldn't walk down the street and know every second person you saw and in hard times, you won't have that network. It's true. And, and that's kind of, you know, I, I've I found in the last few times that, that I've been writing that, that you know, I, I read the comment sections sometimes and, and uh, I really connect with what a lot of people are saying, you know, just around this one guy, you know, he, he said, I, I open my computer every day for some sign of hope, you know, that, that things are going to become more sane, you know, and, and, and other people just... What are we going to do? And and you know, um, one thing that 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 I've found through this is is that with with our sort of local community, um, we have another number of people around who are who are pretty non-compliant about a bunch of stuff. Um, but I found just just the challenge of of practicing some resiliency. Um, just uh, you know, um, we can do this. Uh, this stuff. Um, in place that that we need to have it in place. I went in on a on a wood mill uh, with a guy because uh, we we have a bunch of forest on our property, so we, so we have our wood. Um, a, a lot of the the women, uh, you know, I know that sounds sexist, but uh, you know they get together and they're canning. Um, you know, we're we're trying to find lots of um, you know lots of different ways to um, to, to to just kind of support each other, but you know, when you're, I, I grew up in the suburbs and, and when you're raised with that kind of mindset, you know, you kind of look at things down the road and you're like, you know what, I'm going to have to buck up here. Um, and, and I think, I think we all are, I think we're going to have to recognize that there's, that there's actually a lot more value in, in trusting each other in in building relationships I mean, learning to work with guys, you know, you're, it's, it's one thing to be sort of coffee time friends, but once you start together, um, you know, that's a different kettle of fish and, and you, you know, but, but I think, I, I don't know, I, I, I think we've got to be sort of ready to do that kind of stuff because government's not going to save us. Um, so. No, and, and it's a comforting, it's a comforting feeling, you know, I mean, I'd kind of reach out to some listeners, if you've lost a bit of that, check it out, you'll find your local community center or church or an organization, you might not have taken part in it, but they're still there. And it feels nice. It really does to, to go into your neighborhood and oh, there's such and such as place or there's, you know, I go to the store and I know this person by name, because we were at this event or that. It, it, it just makes you feel a lot better as part of a community. And, and you have that means to to do something if you need to do something in your network and we, we're losing it, but it's not mm -hmm. gone yet. And, and I appreciate your writing, you know, just to show that these are just quit putting it to the government. We can take care of ourselves actually almost always better than the government can. Yeah. 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 No doubt. 
So I'll kind of turn that to a, a prior, you know, tie that into a prior column you wrote as well. And that was about how we uh, basically have let fear take us over, you know, this culture of fear. And, and, and kind of in the same sense, it's, it's a lot more visible in the urban areas where you still see the plastic shields up and there's much more people are face masking themselves and the arrows are still stuck on the floor. We, we didn't allow ourselves quite in the rural areas to get as, as terrified by the plague as, as the urban centers did. But, uh, you know, there's still, I mean, it's it's the media, it's local governments, it's even some neighbors and others that just don't want to let go of this, this as you said, a culture of fear. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, like, you, you, you know, you don't use it, you lose it. And, and, and if we don't, you know, if we aren't tenacious about that and, and kind of keep our eye on the ball and, and, and sort of, you know, keep, keep pushing back. You know, my wife was, was in a, in a library the other day and, and uh, you know, she's talking to the guy behind the desk, like 10 feet away, but she wasn't on the other side of the plastic. Um, and so he asked her to come around now three feet away, you know, behind the plexiglass. And, and I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's just insane. Um, it, it, and, and, um, you know, in, in, in talking to people, you know, we're going back to, to classrooms in the fall and stuff. And, and uh, I think I actually said in that column, you know, it, it, it's we don't need any sort of big, big solutions. We just need to live reality. Um, you know, we just need to actually reach out and shake someone's hand, give someone a hug, um, you know, not tiptoe around each other, because kind of every time you do that, you remind the other person that you know, it's okay. Like, we don't have to give in to this, uh, to this fear. Again, you know, where fear is warranted, we used to always say when there's a when there's a pneumonia sweeping through a, a senior's residence, you don't go. Um, so you, you use your, your sense. But um, yeah, I, I, I think I think just just being tenacious about being being human and, and recognizing that in society that requires some risk. Um, yeah, I mean, one, one of our commenters brought up another point that's been kind of interesting just as in observing this whole thing with the, the pandemic. Uh, Cliff Burkert said, is it fear or ideology? And, and this is where mm. it gets a little bit into the politics of things. And, and you wouldn't have thought that an issue like a pandemic would be so distinctly divided on a right-left spectrum, but it really has turned into that, where people, I guess, who tend to hold progressive types of views, uh, you know, are very solid towards government restrictions on fear, on trying to, uh, in my view, exaggerate the, the fears of things. And of course, on the right, you've got the, uh, well, I mean, to the far end of it, some people saying we shouldn't do anything whatsoever and there should be no yeah. intervention, but but it's still a very distinct line on this that's been drawn and it's kind of unusual. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I, again, maybe that's, maybe that's why I'm kind of, you know, I, I I, I don't know if, if I sort of trust in government to kind of save our butts on this, uh, on this stuff. But, you know, I, I, I think that there is a kind of common sense that we just need to, to kind of exercise with people and take little risks with people. You know, I have, uh, I have loved ones who are, man, they're, they're fully vaxxed and have had COVID more than me. And, um, I, and, and they're all in the CNN culture and, and, and everything. And for, you know, for, for people to, to question that at this point, to question that narrative, that framework, like it's, it's just as risky as it is for, for any of us, but particularly if you're, if you're older and have been raised in a generation where you trust institutions, um, and, you know, and, and so I'm kind of like, like, what do I expect? Like this guy, you know, he's not going to come over to my side. Um, and, you know, all I can do is just, you know, keep, Visiting, keep being natural, you know, maybe every now and then I'll, you know, yeah, write a good study today about this. But um, to, to, to move out of that idea, and, and you watch it happening as the pandemic goes on, right? It's, it's like just more and more and more entrenched. Um, and and uh, it's huge emotional risk, I think, to, to, to actually question if, you know, the CNN is telling the truth or not. Um, so... Well, I mean, as far as positive developments have sort of happened, if we look at the viewership ratings and some of the critical stories with the legacy media, they have not done themselves any favors this last two years. 
in embracing those stances because people are rejecting them. Outlets like ours have been explosively growing. Yeah. Uh, people are voting with their eyes and their feet on that. They, 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 the establishment media overplayed their hand, I think, and, and uh, they, they still don't get it yet. Yeah, I, it's that's I mean, that's another kind of madness, right? Like, I don't I don't get that either. Yeah, like, do they think that we're not going to find the information somewhere else or, like, you know, we know that woman was trampled outside the Shadow Laurier in Ottawa. Like, I had friends that were there. We it, nope, misinformation like how? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 been disturbing, and and that's another institution people are losing tr trust in. You know, not just when we're talking about government institutions or even medical institutions or academic. Uh, that's a whole other uh, ball of wax, perhaps we could discuss another time. Yeah. But the, the media itself, uh, you know, it's, it's not as monolithic as it used to be. I mean, it, it's it's sprung leaks all over the place, and not every alternative outlet is necessarily reliable either. I mean, we're in a period yeah. of transition, but people are rejecting the old. The old dinosaurs is the best way I think I could put it because they just can't turn to change with the times. And uh, I think we'll evolve yeah. for the better, but it's going to be a little bumpy on the way. Yeah, it, it is for sure. And, and um, you know, I don't know. I, I think I think we're going to have to have to be sensible too. like, um, you know, really reflect on what we think Canada has been and 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 should be and and try to be dignified about it and try to recognize that 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 guy over there is my neighbor too and um because there is a temptation to 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 oh you know screw you all um but um you know if we have a hope of building something better um i just wish they'd stop calling it populism i don't know if you <laughs> saw that article in the in the the post about uh you know harper's populist conservatism and uh, no that was cbc um man you know no it, it wouldn't have been popular populism 20 years ago it actually just would have been normal conservatism but yeah, no, everything's just, uh, again, so, so polarized. But I mean, appreciate you. you your columns still tend to take a, a more positive view and a thoughtful one. I mean, I traffic in anger with my columns, and that's just my specialty, but uh, uh, it's, it's good it's to have It's hard that. not to, yeah. Yeah, and it's good to, you know, have that, that variety. So uh, before I let you go, are, are you uh, got one uh, in the cooker for us here? Uh, you know, to be honest, Corey, I have three on the go right now. Um, this this Pope's visit has has really, you know, kind of thrown everything up in the air. And 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 you know, you you get the the kind of secular leftist commentary on this. You know, why didn't the Pope in, include some indigenous spirituality in his Latin mass? Well, he's the Pope. Yes. Um, you know, and and all of this kind of stuff. You know, questions like. Does the CBC really know what forgiveness is? I I don't know. Um, so uh, so we'll see what shows up uh, tomorrow. It, it it might be a couple of weeks of the Pope the Pope, but we'll <laughs> that's all right. It all needs to be discussed, and I certainly appreciate it. Well, thanks for coming on to talk to us today, T Trevor. And I'm I'm looking forward to to seeing what more you've uh, got coming our way. Great pleasure. Thanks a lot, Corey. Thank you. So yes, that is Trevor Tucker. He's been, as I said, a regular columnist with us, and they're really good columns, guys. It's typically weekly when he gets them coming out. I usually put them up for the weekend content, and uh, it's, as you can see from talking to him, you know, just some nice, thoughtful stuff, looking at the broader end of the issues and everything. You know, with me, it's more the, the sword to the guts thing. I hope you read both of our columns, but, uh, you know, it's a different uh, style, and, it, and it's a good one, and it's just always good to have those, those conversations. You know, and that community thing and, and that those broader trends, I mean, societal trends, it really is a, a bad trend. We've let things go and it's hard to get people involved in, in things anymore. And, and we're weaker for it. Um, I use an analogy I've used before. A good friend of mine, a very good friend of mine since I was in my teens named Jamie. And he kind of got involved in politics just due to proximity to me, the poor guy. I, I, I lent him a bad habit. And after an election, though, he thought he'd get involved in his local community center in the city. And, and he attended a meeting, you know, where they were all discussing, discussing, discussing things they're going to do with the community center. And this big issue, I guess, is they had one of those sidewalks with all that decorative gravel next to it. You know, all these white rocks. And they kept getting kicked up onto the sidewalk. And it makes it hard for, you know, wheelchairs or walkers or people walking. Uh, and they've got issues. So they're trying to figure out how are we going to deal with this? What are we going to do? And I guess they spent like half an hour babbling about this. So Jamie went outside for a cigarette. And while he was out there, he swept all the gravel off the sidewalk 
And then he came back in and put the broom down and left and never showed up there again. Uh, you could die death by committee. <laughs> and it's, it's unfortunate. Those are those frustrating things. But that's what happens when you let, uh, I guess you could say, bureaucratic-minded people or government-minded people in on simple tasks. Even the simple task, unfortunately, can't get done. But we shouldn't give up. We should still stay involved with those things and, and uh, get to know them. It's, it's good for us. Uh, I see, I'm just looking at some of the, the commentary. Pamela jones Kenny saying the Methodists are rebuilding four homes in Monty Lake that were burned down uh, in the fire last year. Those people had no insurance. Yeah, like churches still provide a lot of charity and a lot of community uh, value. And I mean, hey, I'm not a religious man. I got a flying spaghetti monster tattooed on one of my arms. I got a few tattoos. I mean, if you know what the flying spaghetti monster is, you can, you can understand that it's, it's not something somebody will get put on themselves if they're a person of strong faith. But it doesn't mean I don't recognize the value of faith communities and churches and some of the things they do. I've, I've talked about that recently. I got a, just down the road from me, a little church that hasn't been holding... Um, their congregation basically got wiped out by the pandemic. It's a little church, one of those small ones. And there were maybe 20 of them in there. And I was just speaking with a gentleman who was maintaining the church the other day. And he said they've just started trying to hold services again. You know, they kind of hold one every couple of weeks. Uh, and I guess their main minister had been on sabbatical. But uh, due to just, you know, congregants getting older and, and uh, some of them passing on and, and just a two-year break from it, they're having a real hard time getting enough people together to, to hold it together. And he used the analogy, you know, it's not like a, a hockey team where young up-and-comers will keep, re, you know, replacing the older ones moving off. Um, younger people aren't going to the churches. And I, I'm not saying people should all re-embrace religion. That's your own personal choice. But these community groups that pull us together and get us in one room, we're losing them. And again, it leads to us handing everything off to the government again. And it, it, the government is not good for a lot. It's not going to do us a lot of favors. And uh, the, so those are the trends that Trevor was talking about in his piece. Um, yeah, you know, uh, was it Marilyn Wall saying a uh, recent poll said 30% of the population is not going to recover from this whole thing? Uh, but yeah, we've got, uh, I'm just seeing, you know, people living rural versus urban. And I, I don't want to turn this into a rural versus urban. The, the main thing, um, oh, Pamela correcting, that was Mennonite, not Methodist. Okay, but it was another church. That's the main thing. Um, so... Uh, you know, these religious communities that value this sense of community and we don't have to let go. If you're not a person of faith, that's fine. That's why I'm saying look to the, the community halls or organizations or social groups. It's, it's really important to get engaged with your neighbors. It's good for all of you. And you can do it in the city. The rural areas are better for it, kind of because of for two reasons, I think. There's a lot of people just who are holding on to tradition a lot longer in rural areas. But the other thing is you kind of have to. Like in my area, and, and I've, you know, there's been stories about it and, and uh, you know, a lot in the news. And when I owned that bar, we got robbed repeatedly. I tell you, the community really pitched in. There's a picture out there, actually, of my bar with the second time I got robbed and the window was all smashed out and we got plywood over top of it. And uh, some neighbors got together with their kids and they, the kids drew a whole bunch of things with, with crayon and, and pinned them onto the plywood board, you know, their drawings and everything, just to say they valued the, the restaurant and the community and everything. You know, you're not going to get that in the city that kind of support. But you can. You still can. It shouldn't have to be just the domain of the rural area. But the other thing was, it was 40-minute response times. It still is in my area for police. Even though I'm 10 minutes from the city of Calgary, it's RCMP is my coverage. And I'm not faulting them exactly. There's only so many at the local d detachment. And if they're in the wrong area when there's an emergency call, the average is 40 minutes. So I'm not whining for more RCMP officers, nor are most of my neighbors. We take care of each other. That's why I said. we got a WhatsApp thing. If there's a problem, neighbors are going to come in. And we've got our own plans. You know, that's why rural areas, you know, for if people looking to be homebreakers, are much, much more dangerous than urban ones, I tell you. Uh, because, of course, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a big, strong, strapping man. Thus, if, if somebody was putting my house at risk in my household and my family, I would uh, do what I have to. And uh, that would mean probably using something more than, than a, a baseball bat. But let's hope it never happens. Either way, just getting back to the, you know, a good discussion. It was, it was, it was good to talk to you with uh, Mr. Tucker about those sorts of things. Uh, somebody was asking about a uh, missing infrastructure money. I'm not sure about the specifics on that one, so I'm not going to dip into it. Uh, send me a note. I, I mean, so many stories always breaking. Uh, boy, our, our government can can really uh, waste our money so often in so many ways. And, it, and that's what I'm talking about, too. Uh, people trusting governments for so many things. And, and this is what I like arguing with conservatives. I've done that on the show a few times. You know, you keep talking about, I don't trust government. I can't stand government. I want less government. 
but I want capital punishment. Hang on a second, guys. Hang on. And again, this gets back to, I'm not defending some of the sick, odious, nasty child molesters or murderers and so on and saying that the world's better off without them dead. No, I know that the world would be better off without them. I just don't ever want to trust the government to be the one to figure that out. Because the government's incompetent, the government's politically motivated, it's ideologically motivated. Uh, people say, oh, but we'll just do it in cases where you know 100%. Well, David Milgard, he just passed away not too long ago, spent 20-some years in jail. They thought 100% he did it. People say DNA changed everything. No, it didn't. There's been mistakes with DNA. And there's been labs that have screwed things up with DNA. So, hey, sentences for life? Absolutely. Capital punishment? No, we, we can't do that. Uh, this government is just too, too uh, bad. So here's another one. Kira Anderson, I imagine you're speaking about Danielle. Uh, why are you promoting her so heavily? Uh, she's a complete disaster. She's only qualified to host a radio talk show. We don't need Kenny 2.0, which is all Smith and Gene are offering. Low on the debate. Okay, well, that's your interpretation. That's fine. I'm not promoting Kira. I mean, that's some of the things that some people get mixed up with this on an opinion thing. I'm not promoting. I'm giving my interpretation. And today it was favorable uh, of Daniel Smith. And it's funny, the other day I was critical of Daniel Smith and a bunch of her supporters went haywire and lit their peckers on fire and threatened to cancel their subscriptions and everything. Guys, I run an opinion show. I'm going to give you my opinion. And as I said, if, if I think one of those candidates misstep, I'm going to call them on it. And if I uh, think they're doing well, sometimes I'll say they're doing well. But I mean, you don't always have to agree. You know, by all means, say my opinion was wrong. Lots of people do and don't hesitate and hate. I hate to admit it, but sometimes I am wrong. Most often I'm right. Except when it comes to dealing with Jane, then yeah, she's always right. All right, but yeah, let's see some of these things. If you're familiar, speaking of government with the go, you know, the Phoenix pay system, this has been ongoing for quite some time. This is their own payroll, their own payroll. And it's been a debacle for decades, they, 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 you know, this was under Harper's government. This was under, I think it started with Cretchen. I'm not even sure, but they've bunged up $2.8 billion on this Phoenix software just to do their own government payroll. And they still haven't figured it out. And they're saying they might need to wait until, what is this, 2034 to transition to a new system? Talk about incompetent. Yeah, really? How on earth can it possibly take, this is government guys, this is government. This is who you're trusting. This is who you are handing off all of your responsibilities in life to. And that's, that's part of what leads to that. I should talk more to Trevor about that, that trend. Because part of what happens with, in my view, and I'll give it to the left, if you want government to be big and take care of everything, it's being lazy. It's being irresponsible. That's what it is. I don't want to have to take care of it for myself so this can take care of it. I don't want to have to do that so government can take care of it. And that way, if anything goes wrong, it's never my fault. It's their fault. They didn't take care of it. No, it's your friggin' fault. It's always your fault. If we can't change the government, that's our fault. And I know the government's not making it easy to change them. And I'm not saying every individual hasn't been trying. But uh, it's, uh, I, you know, this is the group that you're, they can't even pay themselves correctly. We really shouldn't be handing things over to them. It's been a hard times. Let's see. We got wages are up 6.1%, says uh, Stats Can. Yeah, okay. But of course, you know, Cost of living has been shooting up, depending on what you're talking about, into the double-digit areas. So, uh, yeah, we're falling behind. And this is the crisis we got coming up on us right now. I mean, the cost of everything is going up, and uh, our wages aren't uh, not fast enough, at least, to deal with it. But we got some hard times coming. I'd say batting the hatches, and I said it the other day, too, when I was talking to uh, Mike Thomas, you know, and we're talking about mortgages. Now is not the time to borrow. Clear off that debt. Those interest rates are going up and uh, cost of living is going to go with it. So if you can get your books in order, I would strongly suggest you do it right now. Uh, let's see. You know, speaking again of incompetent government, this was a great announcement I saw. So uh, the Wheatland County, just outside of El um, Calgary here, it's down by Carsland. There's a little town. And it uh, looks like they're going to have a $210 million wallboard manufacturing uh, facility built there. And it's going to employ, uh, you know, 100 people. It's going to employ hundreds in the creation of it, you know. And this has been common going on. The city of Calgary has been run by socialist peckerheads for the last uh, 11 years now, starting with Ninchi all the way on to Gondek, who's proven herself to be even worse, along with a lot of city councillors with an anti-business, high-density, obsessive attitude, and has driven citizens and business out of the city alike. They gave 
the Calgary Economic Development, $100 million, tax dollars, a slush fund to say, draw businesses here with it. That started de a decade ago. Completely incompetent. Completely incompetent. Downtown Calgary is still at record vacancy levels, 30-some percent vacant. Uh, the industrial areas drive around. You can see the for lease signs everywhere. But outside of the city, county of Wheatland, Rocky View, Mountain View, new businesses are moving in all the time. And this is what we've got to realize with these local municipal governments. It'll leak out. You can bring in all your stupid anti-business $87 billion climate change plans and crap like that that you like. The money will go elsewhere. They will leave. And you're leaving. they're creating a ghost town in Calgary. And uh, it's, it's tragic. It's tragic. This was a modern, thriving city. And the downtown's now turning into a dystopian nightmare full of vacancies and junkies. You know, the smell of piss permeates every underpass when you walk underneath it. It used to be so noteworthy with anybody visiting Calgary from other cities that, wow, what a clean place. You don't hear that anymore. Not at all. You go downtown, it's just syringes, broken down bikes, garbage, and urine. And this is what this fine progressive, I mean, that there's the trend with it, progressive cities, you always get that in a progressive run city. They're consistent with that uh, challenge. Uh, let's see, World Economic Forum, you know, everybody's favorite group. I, you know, I talk about them a lot. Um, I, I don't think they've infiltrated the politicians nearly as much as a lot of people give them credit for but they certainly do influence a hell of a lot of them and they have to be watched. And they certainly have to be called out with the insanity they propose. Any politician should be embarrassed to be associated with that group whatsoever, whatsoever. They should not be showing up for those uh, functions over there. At least Pierre Polyev was, was calling them out and, and others. And uh, they've just published a paper calling for the end of private car ownership. Yep, you shouldn't have your individual car. And you know what? That doesn't come down to environment. They use that. They use that emergency all the time, but it's a load of crap. It's, it's not the environment why they want to end car ownership. It's because car ownership empowers people. You can drive wherever you like when you own your own car. You can take your employment wherever you like. You can take your family wherever you like. If you got communal transit, and by the way, in Calgary, you can't ride that because it's all over with junkies and poo as well. You've got that, then the government controls you. It controls your movement. It controls your ability to get around. So, of course, the World Economic Forum doesn't like that. It has nothing to do with the environment. It's always about control. The World Economic Forum is all about control. And they're terrified of the automobile. I've talked about that before. The auto is the most empowering item, the personal auto, for labor. More than unions, even. And uh, I know union hacks will get all upset about that. I don't care. They're a bunch of hacks anyways. But I mean, unions did do their thing back in the Industrial Revolution when things were bad. But working in the eastern states, I, I still remember this, this little town. It was up from Salzburg, north of Pittsburgh. I can't remember the name of the town itself. But it had one steel mill in the bottom of it, one rail line going to it. And you could see by the downtown, every building was uniform. It was a company town. The, the, the steel mill had built everything. And that town had been there, you know, 150 years or whatever. But if you worked for that steel mill, that steel mill owned you. They owned the house you lived in. They owned the businesses you bought your groceries at. They, they built the schools. They did the works. And the only way in and out of that town back then was the train, which, of course, they had the contract with. So you could be abused as an employee. I mean, how would you go up? It was in the bottom of a river valley. It wasn't even an easy spot to get out of. Once the personal auto came, things changed. Then all of a sudden, you could drive 20 minutes and work somewhere else. You could move your family somewhere else. You know, the, the, the power that this mill town had over its citizens was lost once the individual automobile came about. That is why the World Economic Forum and control freaks do not like the personal automobile because it empowers you, gives you movement. For the same reason they don't like you having firearms. Uh, let's see. Here's an interesting one. Uh, yeah, and, you know, Jane and I run a BB and b out of our place out there, uh, you know, it's been a great uh, venture. It's going really well. We got a suite attached to a place. And this is an interesting thing, though, that something happened. Welcome again to government. I guess in Toronto, uh, Toronto, the Airbnbs are all tied to the government, to the city. And the Airbnb hosts have to register with the city. And it's all tied together, over-governed. You know, they can't stand that as well, right? How, how would you have people empowered, daring to rent their own property? We, we can't have that. We got to control it. Well, they screwed something up royally. And uh, basically blew out all the reservations. Suddenly, panicked people who were planning to travel found out that they didn't have a booking anymore with these Airbnbs. And these Airbnb hosts didn't know it, but they're finding out that all their bookings have vanished. 
And that was something to do with the bloody integration with the city of Toronto. Th thankfully, that's not happening to us with our place because we're not tied into a local government. But what a mess. What a bloody mess. I mean, as, as, as if Pearson International Airport's mess isn't bad enough and the rest of the crap going on, you know, the arrive can garbage. Uh, we're just turning into a pariah for tourism. Who the hell is going to want to come to this country? Uh, another thing we had in the story, Dave mentioned it with this... Uh, Pervert up in Edmonton, or alleged pervert, like a rat night, rat yaki, whatever. There's a gentleman who got charged. This is somebody who got charged and released yesterday, one day, on bail. Okay? Here's the charges. Sexual assault, sexual interference, luring a child, making child pornography, transmitting child pornography, possessing child pornography, obtaining sexual service for consideration for persons under 18, invitation to sexual touching, distribution of intimate images, and extortion. And that's against six children that they know of. And they're confident there's more. And they let this piece of crap out in hours. We locked Tamara Leash up for 48 days without bail, and she's bailed and back over a petty offense. This is who this government's chasing, is people, a grandmother with no prior hat record, and this perverted piece of garbage, this child-molesting piece of crap, can't even be kept in for a few hours before trial. They let him out. With Look at that list of charges I gave you. With this list of charges, and try and tell me this person is not potentially dangerous upon release, it does say there were conditions, well, yes, but there was also a condition prior to him being put in there. It was a condition called the law saying, don't screw children. That condition didn't stop him. So I don't feel terribly comfortable and safe that his bail conditions are going to keep him from chasing children around. Speed up the court system. Fine. If you're backed up and you can't get to these guys fast enough, let's get more judges. Let's get more cells. Let's get more courtrooms. Let's get more lawyers. Let's spend the money and get these people through the process. But releasing dangerous perverts into the society is not the way to deal with this problem right now. This is an embarrassment as a civilized society. We allow guys like him, who allegedly victimize our most vulnerable, our children, and let them walk on the street within hours after all of a list of charges like that. We're not talking about a guy who was doing something that was just disgusting, you know, say like touching himself near a playground or something. We're talking about a number of charges, a serial offender. This is very, very problematic. All right, I'm going to end on one good note. I will. And uh, it's funny because the things in City Hall in Calgary, two, one is Giancarlo Carra. Uh, they've decided not to. Uh, the council has said that he won't face police investigation for his property dealings, which is unfortunate. But whatever, apparently the council can decide who is or isn't going to be jailed. But on the good side, Sonia Sharp is one of the councillors, and uh, she took her kids for a swim uh, just uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, she had worked as a lifeguard in the past. And while she was watching her kids, she saw actually a six-year-old boy struggling in the water. Um, I guess the local lifeguard hadn't noticed it. And she dove in and rescued and saved a six-year-old child. That's going above and beyond. That's the attitude we need to see, too. She didn't stand there and say, huh, that child's drowning, but i got to wait for the official lifeguard to save the child or I'll call the government service. No, she did what she was supposed to, dove in there, pulled the child out of the water and saved the child from drowning. That's a good citizen. That's how we deal with things. Don't look to government to deal with things. Deal with it yourself and fix it. And if that guy messes with anybody's kids, maybe the parents should fix that too. So, all right. Uh, again, just a reminder to watch Mel Risden's ongoing series, uh, COVID Freedom Heroes. Uh, she's been putting out episodes of that, and they keep dropping. They're fantastic. Watch our channel for it. It's been well-viewed. She had the Justice Center for Community... Um, Constitutional Freedoms on the other day for it. And Linda Slobodian's documentary is finally coming out on the Afghan debacle, and that's going to be released this Friday. And this is huge. It's really good. It's worth a watch. It's 40 minutes, but she talks to retired generals. She lays out what happened, because this is a terrible uh, uh, embarrassment on the part of Canada, and a lot of people who trusted us got victimized out of what happened in Afghanistan. Tomorrow I'll be back with... Brian Geisbrecht, we're going to talk some more on Indian residential schools. I know I talk about it a lot, but it's a big issue, and we got to keep talking about it. And Barry Moore, this gentleman's trying to start a new polling company, a new kind of polling, to try and get more engaged responses. It sounds interesting, so we'll have a discussion with Mr. Moore and, and see how that's going. Of course, I'll have my rant on whatever's got me going in the morning, and we'll have lots of news items to cover as well. So thanks for tuning in today, guys, and I will see you all again tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. sharp.